All right, so uh, let's start with a small test. Yeah, calculate the, the magnitude of this complex number. Okay, I'll give you two minutes. Okay, so who wants to share the answer? Yeah. I got the magnitude to be one. Be one, okay. So how did you get that? So I started by multiplying both the numerator and the denominator by the, by the complex conjugate of the denominator. And then doing that, I then just kind of reduced the whole thing to make this be one K. Okay. Yes, so this is, uh, this is one approach. Okay, yes, yeah, ju just by, uh, okay. By multiplying this by the, so by multiplying the denominator by its conjugate, we know this can uh, make the denominator real number. So in the end, after doing calculations, you get in the denominator is the magnitude to the power of two of this complex number that gives you two. And in the numerator, you just do a standard expansion, it's one plus j squared. So it's one plus j squared plus two j. And one plus j squared equals to zero, so you get j. And this is j times one, so the magnitude is one. Right. So the other approach is to, um, so this is like a taking advantage of the Cartesian form and try to simplify the denominator and then we go to we get the uh, magnitude. The other approach is to look at the polar form. So instead we have a, this is a fraction number. So we know that divisions are easy for uh, polar form, complex numbers in the polar form. So, so here we are going to take, take advantage of this um, formula. So first of all, for any two complex number, uh, Z1 and Z2, the, the magnitude of their division is equals to 
first taking their uh, individual magnitude, calculating their individual magnitude, and then divide one by the other. And if we follow this formula, then um, we just need to calculate these two complex, the magnitude of these two complex, complex numbers respectively, and then just do the division. So, and these two magnitudes are easy to calculate by the, because they are standard in the standard Cartesian form. So one is square root of two, the other is again square root of two, which we give one. So you get the same answer. So the, the question is, uh, how can we show, uh, the, how can we prove this equation? So this is, this is obvious if you use the polar form uh, to represent these complex numbers. So basically I'm gonna use this color. So let's say Z1 is R1 E to the power of J theta one divided by R2 E J theta two. Right, so these are the, standard polar forms. And then uh, by simplification, this is basically R1 divided by R2 E J theta one minus theta two. But again, this is a standard polar form because we have a, map, map, uh, a real number in the front and E to the power of J times S theta one minus theta two. So by definition for this polar form, the magnitude is defined to be R1 divided by R2. So by assumption, this uh, both R1 and R2 should be greater than or equal to zero. Right. So, so this shows that this R1 is basically the magnitude of Z1 and R2 is the magnitude of Z2. Okay, so sometimes it's easier to calculate this magnitude, uh, the, the magnitude of a fraction number by considering uh, the magnitude of the numerator and denominator separately. Let me just reopen this. Okay. Okay. So, coming back to the uh, to to the le lecture. So last time we introduced the concept of uh, signal energy and the signal power, and this is the several examples, some of them are signal, energy signals, some of them are power signals. So let, let's continue with this simple example. Um, so here we are looking at a signal, a real value of signal. You can see that this signal is segmented. It only takes values in different segments. And looking at the values, 
they are all real numbers. So this is a real value signal. And we need to compute the energy of this signal. So for this one, it's uh, pretty straightforward. We just follow the definition of the energy. So this is the original definition. We need to calculate this integration over the entire uh, interval. But since the signal is segmented, so we basically do the integrations uh, one by one. And uh, within this interval, uh, we got zero, signal zero. So we don't have any energy uh, in there. And then looking at uh, between negative one to zero, the signal takes the value of two. So you have integration from negative one to zero and X square is two to the power of two, which gives you four. And then looking at the last interval, uh, the integration is from zero to infinity. And now the, the signal square is this one to the power of two. So you have four times E to the power of negative T. And then the rest of the stuff is to work out this, this calculus integrations. So I will skip that part. But for this example, it's pretty simple because the signal takes a real value. So the absolute value, uh, so the magnitude is basically the absolute value of the signal. So this, this is relatively easy to calculate. And here's another example for uh, discrete signals. So we are looking at XM. This is a discrete time signal. It takes the value uh, one, one over four to the power of N. So it is a diminishing, uh, geometrically diminishing signal. And it only takes this value when N is greater than or equal to zero. Otherwise it is zero. So this signal is a causal signal. So to calculate the energy, we again, by following the def original definition of the energy, we need to sum up all the magnitude to the power of two over the entire uh, discrete time index. But then the, the signal only takes values in the when n is greater than or equal to zero. So the summation starts with zero. And then within this range, the signal takes the form one fourth to the power of n. So we need to calculate the signal, the magnitude of signal to the power of two. So because this is a real, real value signal and it is always positive. So the magnitude of xn is basically uh, the signal itself. Now raise this to the power of two, we get one fourth to the power of two times n. And then uh, you can simplify this to be one, oh, one over 16 to the power of n. And then this is a standard summation, infinite summation of a geometric series. So we have a formula for that. I'm not sure whether I have that here. Yeah, but this, this summation applying the formula, the sum over, <clears throat> yeah, this one is basically, It basically takes this sim simple form. So that's why you have, so you basically use this one. So A equals to one over 16. So you plug in that here, you get the final result. Right. So you basically follow the definition and then um, be careful when you sometimes many uh, 
sometimes the signal is segmented. So you need to take care when you determine the, the range for this index. Okay. So the definition is from left infinity to positive infinity. But in this example, the signal only exists in the positive domain. So the summation should start from zero. Yeah, and then let's look at let's look at this uh, problem. So we are given that the energy of a signal is given to be capital E. Okay, so the energy of x t is given to be capital E. Now, what is the energy of the following signals? And these signals are. Uh, variance of the original signal. They are, for example, for the first signal, it is a scaled version of the xt, it's 10 times xt. And this is, this is very, uh, this is, can be obviously obtained by the definition of energy. As the energy is defined to be, right, is the integration or summation of the magnitude to the power of two. So if we scale the signal uh, by a constant, then everything inside will be scaled by that constant, to, uh, that magnitude of the constant to the power of two. Therefore, uh, going back to this example, The energy of this uh, 10 times xt is basically integration of 10 times xt, the magnitude to the power of two dt. And you can see that this 10 uh, will give us a factor of 100. And this part is is the energy of EX. So after uh, a scaling, the energy is scaled by in a quadratic way. So if we multiply by, if we scale the amplitude of the signal by A, then the signal, the energy will be scaled by A squared. Now actually here, I should put a magnitude sign. So more generally, if we scale the energy of A times X, here this A could be any complex number. It's basically you know, the magnitude of A squared times E X. Right. You can see if, if here, instead of having a 10 here, if we have any general complex number A, then A times X T, uh, taking the magnitude equals to the, okay, so here's the A times XT, taking the magnitude equals to A magnitude times XT magnitude. Right. And then you raise this to the power of two, so you have this power of two everywhere. So that's why you get this additional factor. But for this example, this uh, scaling factor is a real number. So it's 10, the magnitude of 10 is just 10. So you get 10 to the power of two gives you 100. Now the second, uh, so the second signal is a time scaled version of this XT. Uh, we will discuss operation uh, later, but it is X, two times t instead of xt. And let's, let's look at how to calculate, how to relate the energy of this signal to the energy of the original signal. Let's write down the, the definition. 
of this signal. We are looking at the energy of X two times T. Now by definition, this is the original definition of this signal. Okay, we are looking at the magnitude to the power of two in taking integration over the entire time interval. Now, the question is, how do I relate this? With the energy of the original signal, how do I relate these two integrations? Right, basically a change of variable, right? So we just uh, multiply um, here, multiply this by two and divide by two. So continue, continue this part. Uh, it is one half integration. Now we can treat two times T as a new variable. It's X E prime, let's do it. And this part is basically the same as this one. We just use a different notation. So we can see that uh, if if we scale the time 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 axis by a factor two, then the energy it will be scaled by the in a reverse uh, in a reverse way. It's one divided by this factor. So it's one half. So more generally, if we time scale the signal by b. So if we are looking at X dt, then the energy of this signal is basically one over the magnitude of B, uh, the absolute value of B times the energy of X. And the last operation is the time shifting. So we are we are looking at x t minus five. We are shifting all the time index to the right by five units. And turns out that shifting the signal will not change the energy because it will not change the integration. Right? If you draw any signal and uh, it's corresponding shifted version. So it doesn't matter which one you you integrate over. Right? So the integration, it only changed the relative location of the signal. It doesn't change the integration. So mathematically, you can do, you can look at the energy of this time shifted signal. Again, we can do a change of variable for free this time. And because the integration is over infinity to infinity, so T minus five doesn't change the range of this variable. So you get, you can define T minus five to be T prime. So it doesn't, doesn't really change the the energy of the signal. And this is by definition, this is the energy of X, XT. Okay, so time shifting will not change the energy of the signal. Okay, so uh, are there any questions? Okay, so, uh, for the, for the students over the Zoom, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to unmute yourself and and say uh, and speak in the in the channel. Um, I have a quick question. Okay. Uh, so, are there any um, 
situations where changing the variable like that, like if it was t minus three or something, but you have um, uh, the original problem said, you know, that that part of the wave or signal is from like zero to five or something, it behaves in that part. Does changing the variable um, affect that in some cases? Does that make sense? Yes, yes. So, so you are. So, what you are saying is that uh, sometimes we don't have infinity here. We have a finite interval. Yeah. Uh, right. Um, that that may let, let me think about this. Um, I think that may change the may change the signal energy in some cases. Um, but okay, but let's put it in this way. Um, if you have, I, I think this applies to any signal. Okay, I, I think it's a little bit tricky. So if you, if you look at the signal that only lasts for a finite duration, like this one, and I think if you sh if you just shift this signal either to the left or to the right, it doesn't doesn't change the energy because you can see that you, you will you will still integrate over this red curve. So so the all the energy part will be will remain the same. Uh, so for example, uh, for the black curve. Let's let's call this x one. Let's call this x t. And let's say uh, the shifting is about one unit. And then this red one would be okay. The red curve would be x t minus one. Okay. In in that case, uh, the energy of x t is integration over a to b x t square d t right and looking at the the red one the energy of t x t minus one um, so now we are now the signal is shifted and correspondingly the range of this uh starting point and end point will also be shifted. So we are starting from A plus one and uh, here is B plus one. Okay. And then you do a change of variable for free and you define this to be okay, T prime. So, so let, let, let's, um, Prime, right, so T prime is T minus one. Okay, that means right, but T is from for this signal, for this shifted signal, T is from A plus one to B plus one. So T prime is from T prime is T minus one, is from B to A. So after a change of variable, you have, now you will replace T minus one by T prime. And then T prime is in the range of A and B. And this is exactly the same as uh, what we have here. Okay. So we would just uh, shift the range in that situation as well. Yeah, in this case, if if this uh, upper and lower limit they are finite, then they will also be shifted. So everything okay. after a change of variable, everything will remain still remain the same. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, this is a good question. This also reminds us that when you deal with uh, energy, computer energy, or or power of time shifted signals. All time scale signals, 
uh, you should be very careful uh, about these limits. Sometimes they are not in, infinite. But in the end, mathematically, all this will, uh, in the end, you will need to deal with uh, change of variable in calculus. So if you are familiar with that, you should be able to handle all, all, all of this. So we will go over some examples uh, right next after we introduce these basic operations. Yeah, so, so now we'll talk about some uh, basic transformations or operations of signals. Uh, this include uh, scaling in the amplitude or in the time domain. So we, we have seen this uh, in the previous slide. So the, the amplitude scaling is a very simple operation. We basically multiply the signal xt by any complex number a, right? So this is this is a cont continuous time signal, discrete time signal. We can always do this amplitude scaling operation. And here, everything, and here a is a complex number. You can always modulate signal by multiplying it by complex number. Okay, and we have seen that this will, this will uh, change the energy of the signal. Basically, the energy will be scaled by the magnitude of A to the power of two. And this time scaling operation is a very important operation and it's a little bit tricky to understand. So here we are looking at XT, uh, we time scale the time axis. So we multiply, we scale the T by uh, factor B. Here B is any real number. Because we are, this, these are time variables. So this scaling factor B is arbitrary real number. Could be a positive number, could be a negative number. But if we do time scaling for discrete time signals, uh, then we have to, we must use integers. Uh, so that all the after after scaling the index will also be integers. Okay, so this is a little bit special for discrete, but it's also very intuitive. Now the the effect of time scaling uh, is that we can we can visualize this effect. So the effect is that after scaling the t by a factor b the time axis will be scaled by one over the absolute value of b. Uh, now, what does that mean? So specifically, that means if the magnitude of b is greater than one, the, then the time axis or the signal will be squeezed. For example, uh, if you look at this, this figure, uh, this is the original signal, a triangular signal. The range is between zero one, uh, negative one to one. This is xt. Now, if we scale the uh, t by a factor two, then you can see that the resulting signal is squeezed along the time axis, and the squeezing factor is one over the scaling factor b. Right. So because the factor is two, so you replace b by two here the time, time axis scaling factor is one half. Basically the time axis is squeezed by one half. And uh, on the other hand, if this scaling factor is less than one, then the time axis will be expanded. So looking at this example, this is x, uh, we are scaling the time variable t by the factor, by the factor one over two. Okay. Now this factor is less than, strictly less than one. So if we do that, the resulting effect is that this signal will be expanded over the time axis and the scaling factor is one over, and now this B, this factor, scaling factor is one half. So one over one half, that gives you a time scaling factor of two. That means the time axis will be expanded by two times.
for the amplitude scaling, yep. you said that we were using a complex number to do that for the A. Yes. How does that work? Like, what does that do to the wave? Yeah, so, so here, well, in general, right, in this course, when we talk about um, signals, they are generally uh, complex value signals. So in general, this xt or xn, they could be complex numbers. They, they will take complex values at a certain time t. So we can generally scale the signal, scaling this complex number by multiplied uh, by another complex number. So if, for example, if the signal, if we know the signal has, uh, suppose this is a complex signal, so we can write out is uh, polar form. So that means for any at any time t, uh, this signal is a complex number, and that complex number can be written into a standard polar form. It has a magnitude and has a phase part, right? I, it, and now if I multiply it by an, any complex number, uh, A, and A could have a, again, it has a polar form representation. So by scaling this signal uh, with this complex factor, we are basically So we are scaling the magnitude of the signal by the magnitude of this factor. And at the same time, we are modifying the phase of the signal. By this, uh, by the phase factor of the, by the phase component of the factor A. So basically about by scaling the amplitude, if the scaling factor Amplitude, amplitude scaling factor is a complex number. Then we are doing two things at the same time. We are scaling the magnitude and the phase of the signal uh, at the same time. Yeah. So all it, it's actually scaling the magnitude and then changing the phase by a constant phase factor. Right. So, so this is, later on we will see that this will be used in the modulation techniques if we design this scaling factor in a special way. Does this answer your question? Yeah, that's kind of what I thought was gonna happen. Yeah. Yeah, so so this one could be could be a complex number. But here this B is a, always a real number because we are talking about time, time index. Okay, so uh, are there other questions? Yes. Uh, are you talking about amplitude scaling? Okay, yeah, if that's okay. If, if it's negative two, um, for this for this signal, uh, if it's negative two, then it's the same because the negative one, so the negative sign will correspond to a time reversal, which we will introduce right next. Yeah, but if the signal is asymmetric, then it, it will be different. I think we will see one example uh, in the next page. Right, so it's time reversal. Time reversal is basically we are reverse the signal in the time on the time axis. So we are looking at x and negative t or x negative n. And, and the visually, this is basically if, if we are looking at this signal, then the time, then the reverse the signal is basically uh, we are reversing the signal along the time axis. So before the signal exists in the positive time domain, and now the signal is reversed into the negative part. Yeah, 
And if we if we are looking at, for example, uh, looking at this signal between zero and one. And if we want to look at X uh, negative two T, so we have we have a combination of two operations here. One is the factor of two, which which corresponds to the time scaling operation, and we have another factor is negative one, negative one times two. That negative one corresponds to the time reversal operation. So combining these two operations, we will first squeeze the signal. Um, by a factor of two and then reverse the signal. So in the end, you get a squeezed and reversed signal. So we will talk about the combinations of, of the operations later. Okay. So this is time reversal, basically, scaling the change the sign of the time variable and the last one is time shifting well this is pretty standard so we are looking at xt minus shifted by a constant unit a but this here's the uh, rule for understanding the time shifting operation so if we are subtracting if this t is subtracting up, so here we always assume, let, let's always assume a is, a is bigger than uh, zero, okay? So if we are subtracting, okay, if we are subtracting a positive number from the time variable, then this means shift to the right by a unit. And if we are uh, adding T by a positive number, then this means shift the, shifting the signal to the left by a unit. Okay, so if the signal is uh, is shifted to the right, that means uh, looking at the bottom figure, if the signal is shifted to the right, that means the signal is delayed, right? Because this, the same, uh, looking at these two points, after shifting the signal will, this signal will occur uh, after eight seconds. So basically that means the signal is delayed. If the signal is shifted to the left, the signal is advanced. Right. So this is the this is how you determine whether to shift to the left or to the right by looking at uh, the sign of this shifting factor. So make sure this a is always positive. So we are minus a positive factor. That means we are shifting to the right, otherwise shifting to the left. And here we have this, we can combine all these basic operations to modify a signal, time scaling, amplitude scaling, time shifting, time reversal. Everything can be combined together. And uh, these operations can be performed in any order, but we need to take, uh, we need to ver be very careful when you uh, determine the order of these transformations. And we will see one example right next. So let's look at, let's look at this problem. We have a signal XT. Now, how can we, or what type of basic operations should we use to get this signal? So 
So equivalently, this is two p times two, right? They are equivalent. So how to how to transform this x t to x two t minus one by uh, by leveraging the basic operations? And so we have two passes here. We have two different approaches. And the only difference is that uh, should we do shifting first or scaling first? And turns out both of them can work. So for example, if we do shifting first, um, and then we know that uh, in the end, we will subtract two subtract two from the time variable. So we need to somehow first from xt go to xt minus two. And then in the end, we will scale the, we will do a time scaling to scale the time variable by a factor two. But if we do scaling first, then we will first scale the time variable by a factor two and then shift the time factor uh, by, by one. But you can see that this, these two different approaches are not equivalent in the sense that um, we can write these operations specifically. So let's look at each operation one by one. So let's look at the first, first pass. We are doing a shifting first and then do a scaling. Now here's my question. Um, along this path, what does the first operation uh, corresponds to? So we are we are changing from x t to x t minus two. So what type of operation is this? Right, it looks like the time shifting, right? So this is time shifting and specifically uh, looking at this from T to T minus two. So basically this A should be two. So when A is greater than zero, we are shifting to the right. So it's shift, shift to the right by two units. Okay, so that's the first operation. We will shift x t to the right by two units. We will get x t minus two. Now, how do we change x t minus two to x two times t minus two? So what, what type of, of operations do we have here? Amplitude scaling and uh, yes, But, but it's a little bit different here because when we talk about amplitude scaling, yeah, we don't have that. We don't have this time shifting factor. So um, the question is, would that change the time scaling operation here? Do you think that will, that will be different from the basic time scaling? Uh, here in this time scaling formulas, we don't we we just have t. We don't have any uh, constant fact, time shifting factors. So it will be more clear if we define if we define this one. Let's call this one a signal y t. Let's call it y t. I'm just redefining this signal. Now, how can I how can I interpret this signal in terms of y? So if y t is x t minus two, so what is x two t minus two in terms of y? So if you can compare these two, the only difference is that t is being replaced by two times t, right? So this should be y 
Imagine uh, if you define y t to be x t minus two, then y two times t should be basically replacing t by two times t. So you get x two t minus two, right? And then this is clear. This is y t, and in the end we, we need to have y two times t. So this is a standard time scaling uh, operation. So we are a scale, time scale. So this is time scale by by the factor one over the scaling factor one over two. One over two. So it's a signal is squeezed. <clears throat> okay. So in the end, the first pass along the first pass. We first shift the signal by to the right by two units, and then squeeze the signal uh, over the time axis by one half. So that's the that's the combination of these two basic operations: shifting, shifting first, and then scaling uh, afterwards. Okay, now let's look at the second pass. We are doing scaling first and then shifting. Okay, now what is the first operation from x t to x two times t? What is this operation? Time scaling, right? There's a very standard time scaling. So it's time scale by one half. So we are squeezing the signal, squeezing xt by one half. Okay, now look at the second one. From x two times t to x two times t minus one, what is this operation? Well, again, let's, we can just define, always define this as a new signal, yt. If we define x two t to be y t, now what is this? Y t minus one, right? Because what you need to do is, if y t is defined to be two times t, right? Then y t minus one is basically replacing t by t minus one. But then this t is multiplied by two. So when you replace t by t minus one, uh, you will, keep this multiplication factor is t minus one, the entire t minus one multiplied by two. So it's a replace of variable. Okay, now this, then this is, this will be easier for you to understand the, the, the type of operations here. So we are, we are basically, you know, if we call the second signal yt, then the last signal is yt minus one. And this is basically a, time shifting operation from yt to yt minus one. So this is shift from yt to yt minus one with shifting to the right by one. Shifting to the right uh, by one. And then if you compare, uh, if you compare these two different uh, passes, you will see that the time scaling operation is the same. We always do a time scaling by one half, but the time shifting uh, part is different. If you follow the first pass, we will shift in the, uh, in the first operation, we shift to the right by two. But if you do the shifting uh, in the second step, right, like in, this, in the second pass, if you do a shifting after time scaling, you only need to shift to the right by one, right? So these two, depending, the, depending on the order of these two operations, the shifting part will be different. So you need to be very careful when you 
uh, do the combination, do this combination of uh, basic operations. But in practice, you can always stick to one of them, depending on which, which path you like. And the intuition is that, uh, why, this, why the shifting part is different? Because uh, if you do the time scaling, if you do the time scaling first, then it is like the axis is already, the scale of the time axis has already changed. So when you do the shifting part, you need to adjust the shift accordingly. Right. And if you do the shifting part first, then uh, this is not, this will not be affected by the time scaling operation. So you can see that if you do the shifting part first, you directly shift the signal to the right by two to get this negative two factor. But if you do the time scaling part first, after time scaling, the T is multiplied by two. So after that, that any, any time shifting applied to the time axis will be amplified by two. So you need to shift by one. And then this shifting multiplied by amplified by two will give you the negative two uh, time shifting factor. So this is a little bit different. So it critically depends on the order uh, of, this, of these two operations. Okay, so uh, any questions about this part? Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask something to clarify. So essentially what's happening here is like, since we're still shifting over by two in that second option, we have to scale the value that we're shifting by, by the time scale that we're shifting. And that's why we end up with the one. Yes, so you can see that in the end, this two times negative one gives you negative two. Right. But yeah, yeah, but depend. Yeah, but here we are doing the shifting part after the scaling part. So the this part should be. Uh, we need to consider the scaling effect before before that. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, and you can well you can, I guess we can we can verify this by by looking at this. Uh, by looking at this example. So um, we have this triangular signal, negative one, 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 and we can follow the two paths, apply these operations and see if we can get the same final signal. They should be the same if this is correct. So we'll first shift in by two and then scale squeeze by one half. Okay, so, um, Shifting by two, we have negative one plus two, we get one. One plus two, we get three. And then we do a squeezing. And the squeezing part is basically divide all the numbers by, by two. So you get, I'm using a blue color, you get one half. One divided by two is one half. Three divided by two is 1.5. 1.5 is about here. Okay, so this is the final signal. It's between one half and two over three, three over two. And this, this is what we obtain following the first pass. And we can do this for the second pass. So now we are doing uh, time scaling first. Time scaling by one half. So we, are, we get a squeeze the signal. Dividing everything by one half, we get this is negative one half and this is one half. So this is a squeezed signal. And then we are shifting the signal to the right by only one unit. So negative one half plus one, you get one half. One half plus one, you get three over two. So in the end, you, you end up with the same signal. Okay, so these are 
different uh, orders of these operations but end up with the same signal. Yeah. So it, sometimes uh, it is often convenient if you, if you are not familiar with uh, this combination of operations at the very beginning, it is often convenient to introduce this auxiliary notation to help you understand the, the last uh, the last operation okay so this is about uh, the basic operations of signals So next we'll talk about uh, periodic signals. And I think this, this, this is a very uh, intuitive concept and we are already very familiar with it. So uh, we say a signal is periodic if uh, we say a signal is periodic if there exists a period T enough such that uh, if we shift the signal by T naught then the signal will uh, achieve the same value. So xt equals to xt plus or minus t naught. And we call this capital T naught is the, the period of the signal. For example, we know sine signals have a period two pi. So sine t equals to sine t plus two pi. So that's the, that's the idea of periodic signals. <clears throat> And we can define similarly for discrete time signals. Uh, it's basically the same definition that when a signal is discrete, the period can only take this uh, can only take integer values. So that's the only difference. And then for a per periodic signal, it may have multiple periods. Uh, for example, for sine signal, two pi is a period, and then any integer times two pi is also a period. So we call, therefore, we call the smallest period, the fundamental period of the signal. Because the other periods are kind of redundant. So we only need to take care about the smallest period. And this is a, a example to extend a signal to, to a periodic signal. So if basically, if you have any signal, you can extend it to a periodic signal by copy and paste the signal segment uh, periodically. And for periodic signals, uh, it will be easier to calculate the power. So instead of doing that limit definition, uh, we introduce the definition of power by looking at the limit of the average energy. Now, because the signal is periodic, meaning that the signal is always a copy of itself within every period. So we can only look at the power within one period. So basically similar to the definition of power. So the, the idea of power is basically looking at the average energy. So since now the signal is periodic, so we can look at any period from A to A plus capital T. Now this A could be arbitrary and capital T is the period of the, of the signal. Looking at any period of the signal and, and integrating the energy, the total energy of the signal over that period, and then divide the total energy by the length of the period. So this is like the average energy over a period of the signal. But, the, but because the signal is periodic, so this is equal to the uh, definition of power. Therefore, to calculate the power of a periodic signal, we only need to look at uh, one period of the signal. Now, for example, uh, if we want to calculate 
the power of this cosine sigma. Now xt equals to c, c times cosine omega naught t plus theta. We can follow, now we know that cosine sigma is a periodic sigma. So we can, we can use this formula instead. We pick any period capital T, one over capital T integrating over any period, A to A plus T. And then the square of the signal is C square cosine square DT. Okay. And then uh, applying the formula for cosine squares, cosine square equals to one plus cosine two times the angle divided by two. So we end up with this one. Right. So C square is moved to the outside. And this two is because of the cosine square. And then, uh, here, we, the integration have two parts. One is the constant part one. The other is the, the, other is the cosine part. And because the cosine is, is, is the periodic part, so integrating this periodic part over the period, we know that integrating a cosine signal over one period, we end up with zero because half of the period will be positive, half of them will be negative. So they will cancel out. So this part, the integral, taking the integration over one period, we get zero. So we only have the first part. Now the first part is basically you know, a constant one. So taking the integration, we get capital T. And this, and this capital T cancels with the capital T in the denominator. So we, so we get the power is C squared over two. And this is the formula for, for the power of cosine sequence. It's the, it's the amplitude to the power of two divided by two. Okay, so basically when you deal with uh, periodic signals, uh, the power can be calculated by looking at any, any uh, specific period. And this is a discussion about the period of some of periodic signals. So the idea is that if we have two periodic signals and they have different periods, X1, for example, X1 has a period T1 and X2 has period T2. And now we sum them up. Now the question is, is this a periodic signal? You know, if, if, if so, what is the period of Y1? So the first question is, can, can this generally be a periodic signal? If you sum up any two periodic signals, is it, can it be non-periodic? Both, if both of them are periodic, they have periodic structure, summing them up, will that be a periodic signal? I would think it happens sometimes because like mm -hmm. if x2 is equal to negative x1, then it's just zero and it's not periodic. But, you know, if they, if they are both periodic, then it's got to repeat again. But I, was, but I would argue that zero can be regarded as a periodic signal. And the period is any, anything, right? Because by that mm. then, Yes, you add anything to the time, you always get zero. So is there a non-trivial example where you add two, two where you add two peer, periodic signals, you end up with a non-periodic signal? That, that is a little bit counterintuitive because most of the figures that in our minds are regular. So you will always have a periodic output after summing up two periodic signals. But we can, we, we do have a counter example. And the idea is very simple by, look, by looking at the definition 
of theories. Uh, so the idea is that, okay, sorry about the emails. If these two periods, T1 and T2, if they have a common multiple, then once you sum them up, it, it will be a periodic signals. For example, um, for example, if one period is 12, the other period is uh, yeah, if one period is 12, the other period is 63. If T1 is 12, T2 is 63. Then when you sum up these two periodic signals, you, you will get a periodic signal. By, by looking at its common multiple. Uh, now, now the common multiple by factoring out all the, all these two numbers, three times two times two, 63 is seven times nine, nine is three by three. Uh, these are all the factorizations. And to find out the common multiple, we will just look at uh, the, the non-overlapping uh, factors. So we have one three here. So we will ignore one of the three. So it's three by two by two by seven. I think I need another three. So this is the common multiple of the signal. So you do the mass. I don't know what it is. Four four times. Nine thirty six times seven that gives you two hundred fifty five. So this is the this will be the period of the sum of these two signals. If you can find the common multiple of these two periods, but this this is, does not this may not exist in general. For example, if in particular if one of the period is a irrational number. Uh, if T1 is a rational number, T2 is pi, and then you can never find a common multiple because pi is irrational. And in this case, if you sum up these two signals, they will not be, they, it will not be periodic. Okay, so this is one uh, kind of example. And similarly, if you multiply the term together, again, you are looking at the common multiples. So you will also, it may also be a non-periodic signal in general. Okay. And then we can, uh, the next concept that we, we will introduce is even and odd signals. And we have seen this in, for example, we know sine signals, they are all signals. Uh, cosine, cosine function is the even function. So in general, for uh, the, the, the definition of even signal is that if we reverse the signal, uh, if, if you do a time reversal, the signal will uh, remain the same. So if this is satisfied, the signal is uh, it's called an even signal. Uh, Otherwise, if we do a time reversal and signal becomes negative, the amplitude becomes negative, then we call this a off signal. And this is the definition. After, a time, after performing a time reversal, it equals to the negative of the original signal. And this concept is very useful because it turns out any, any signal any arbitrary signal can be decomposed into uh, one even signal plus one odd signal. So we call that even part uh, X sub E and we call the odd part, we denote the odd part X sub O. And these two parts can be constructed uh, in a very simple way. So X sub E is basically adding up XT the average of xt and this time reversal. 
And the odd part is basically the difference between XP and its time reversal. And you can check that uh, by definition, these two are even and odd respectively. So for example, if XE is de defined is defined in this way, then we will have, uh, okay, to verify XE is an even signal, we follow the definition. We just need to show that the reversal of XE is the same as, uh, as itself. So we look at the reversal of XE. This XE negative T. And basically we are, we are replacing T by negative t. So we end up we end up with x negative t plus x t. And you can see that by doing a reversal, we still have x. This is equals to x uh, e t. So this shows that this x e part is an even part. And following the similar uh, strategy, you can show that the x o part this signal is a odd part. And this is a <coughs> illustration uh, of the even uh, an odd part of a signal. So this is a general signal XT. We can see that it is, it is neither even nor odd. It is generally asymmetric, right? And by following this, by following these two formulas, we can uh, construct this even and odd part. And turns out for this example, for this particular signal, um, the even part takes, takes this form. And we can see it's a symmetric, it is even. And the odd part by taking the difference between the XT and X negative T, we can this is the visualization of the odd part. It is a straight line and it is a odd function. So the original signal can be decomposed into uh, the even part plus the odd part. And this applies to any arbitrary signals. Yeah, so I think this, uh, in this lecture, we basically introduced uh, uh, some basic properties of signals, basic operations, and uh, talking about their periods, talking about even and all parts. So with these basic concepts, starting from the next lecture, we will introduce uh, many different types of useful signals that we will uh, utilize throughout this course. Okay. So I think with this, you can finish your homework one and we can discuss the homework in the next lecture. And also I will be hosting office hours uh, in the afternoon. Okay, so I think I will stop here. I will see you uh, next week. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Professor, I had a uh, quick question about um, the uh, the lab, the last um, problem on the lab. Okay, uh, will you, oh, can you give me like five to 10 minutes? I, I need to leave the classroom for, and so if I, after I go back to the, to my office, I will connect through the Zoom, okay? Okay, sounds good, I'll see yeah. you there.